race you're in. What does staying the course look like for you? Did you know the, number, the enemy's number one goal is to throw you off? It's true. The Bible says in Matthew 24 that in the end times that the goal of the world would be to have deception come over the people of God. How's the church deceived? How are we deceived in the day we're living? Is it possible? Tor Torrin Wells there says in his uh, remarks to us this morning that we're living in a day where truth is in question. We're living in a time where anything that is once considered right is possibly being challenged. That's okay. I understand to test things, to see if norms are okay or should, be, should they be thrown out the window? Is it right to live a certain way or is there another way of doing it? It's okay to test some things, but the scriptures tell us that it's important for you and I to stay the course. What does that look like for you and I? I was reading this week about uh, someone that our financial advisor here probably has read about more than me. A little article came up on the iPhone about Warren Buffett's life. At the age of 10, they said he's one of the richer men in the world, but at the age of 10, it says that he learned the principle of compounding interest being worth 68 billion today. I believe he's barking on close to 90, 89, 90. But he learned that if you save 50 cents, you could get it to 51. You could get it to a dollar. Then that dollar could become two dollars. And he learned that early on. And he got excited about that. And that's how he's conducted his life. But did you know in your life, trying to do right, in your life, trying to live uh, the, the right way, you've been introduced to Jesus. You came to Christ in some way. You accepted him. You thought at one time, yeah, I, I believe this is the right way. You were introduced to it. Excited about it. Began to think, this is the way I'm going to pattern my life. It started working for a while. You saw some benefit in it. And then something happened. You began to get worn down with the cares of the world. Maybe the attacks of the world, maybe the direction of the world started to pull you a different direction. And you're here this morning wondering, you're being challenged in your faith. It would be easy for you to be introduced to something else. It would be easy for you to say, well, I think there's another way. I remember my daughter, first daughter, coming home from college. We dropped her off there. And two or three years in, uh, she, I remember her saying to me, well, I think there's another way. That's what our, our brother, that's why Muzi, I'm going to stay on him. He's up in that northern Wisconsin. He's, he's, that's another side thing. He's going to come home after his freshman sophomore. There's another way. I'm going to let him know, no, there's only one way. But I remember my daughter. I'm not saying about the, um, we just have a running joke going between us. But I remember my daughter thinking, saying to me, there's, there's another way. And I said, okay, I got it. I know that it would be easy for us to, to get worn down, to be challenged, or, or not even that, be introduced to something where it would be easy for us to drift. Friends, it's important for you and I, if you are going to win, if you are going to be successful in, uh, in the ways that you believe God is like, that you stay the course. It's important to understand the race you're in. Did you know that 
the scriptures, Paul did call what you're doing a race. As a matter of fact, Paul, another call, time called it a fight. He called it the races. He was trying to describe your life. He, he called it the race. Another time he, he said the fight you're in. I don't know what descriptive term you want to use it this morning about your life, but it's true. You're in a fight. You're in a race. You're in living your life. As you look at your life, call it a fight, call it a race, call it trying to do what you think right is right. I want to look at a few scriptures where Paul was talking about the race, the life. Where Paul was talking about how we should conduct ourselves. Some of you know I, I ran cross country in my earlier days. And I remember lining up to the line several times. It was almost like yesterday, though it was probably 40, 50, 40 some years ago. Or 40 years ago, but I remember lining up there. Every time I lined up there, I regretted it. I was thinking, what am I doing here? We'd be working all night in the bakery. My dad owned a family bakery, so we had to go to work. Saturday was our big day. We had to, we had to make the money on that day. So we was raised in the trade, but so we all had to participate and get there at one in the morning. But maybe on that Saturday, he would let me go at maybe seven, eight o'clock because we had to be at that meet. Geneva, St. Charles, we we're in the little seven conference. Sycamore, those schools. But I remember lining up there and I would be looking and a hundred yards down the road, I'd see this hill start to go this way. Oh, I'd be tired. I was up most of the night working. Came from my baker, closed my whites to, to this race, this meet they called it. I'd line up there and we'd be geared, we'd get here, we wouldn't get down, we'd, we'd be like this, a line. And I always knew there was a lot of people better at this than me. See, I was in this because I knew the sport that I wanted to be in, wrestling, was coming up. And I knew by January that I needed to be in good shape because when I stood on those scales and I saw someone like Muzi next to me with big arms, I would start to tremble. And I'd say, because they'd line us up next to each other. And I'd be there like this, tired, just ate a donut before I got there. No, that's not true. I had to make weight. But, and I'd get scared because I knew that, man, he could outdo me. Though Mosey could never have taken me, of course. <laughs> never. But I was there and, and I'd see it before me. But I'm wondering about your life today. You've been worn down. You've lived some life. You've seen some things before you. And the world is trying to pull you another direction. We're going to have the scripture on the screen here. Two verses, seven and eight. But the world would try to tell you that this is the way. Follow in it. The writer in the Gospels called it deception. Some called it being pulled away. As a matter of fact, the scriptures even said it this way, that not too many people may make it at the end because it's a long, narrow road. And he tried to say it's a long, narrow road. And you're going to get tired. You're going to get weak. You see, living for Jesus may not actually be completely for the faint of heart because it's hard to Choose what is right. It's easier to sit on that bar stool. It's easier to just throw off all restraints and say, this is the way I'm going to go. You see, it's hard to be obedient. It's hard to be under submission to God. It's hard to raise your family the right way. It's hard to stay pure, to be true. We're living in a world of darkness. To be light in the world today is tough. To stay at it. The other day I said to my wife, I said, wow, 
I'm getting a little tired of this. It seems like Sue, no, I didn't quite say it that way. Let me stop there. I said, you know, Sue, we've been at this thing, this now phase. You know, we have phases. As you get as old as I, you start breaking up life in phases. Well, this third phase, maybe only one phase left. But, uh, uh, but I said, you know, we've been at, chopping at this bit for like 17 years. It seems like every day, every day, it's getting up and doing it all over again. And I start thinking, if you're anything like me, you, you're there. Don't tell me you don't talk this way. Oh, would have been better to do that. I wonder if 10 years ago, should we have done that? Now, don't judge me this morning because we know it, we all talk this language. We all look back. We all look to the side. We all look to the left. We all challenge ourselves from time to time. Should we be in Florida come January? We're all going to be there. No, in our minds. But I want to talk to you about the race you're in. I want to talk to you about what you're doing. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you? To keep you from obeying the truth. This kind of persuasion, that kind of persuasion, does not come from the one who calls you. I've looked at the scripture in my past days in ministry preaching a few times, but I want to look at it differently this morning. I want to see the scripture in a different light. Oh, before this, it's, it talks about, it says, stand firm. Don't let yourself be burned again. You're in a race. Actually, you're in the race of your lifetime. It's true. There's things pulling away at you. There's, there's the world's trying to talk you into something contrary to what you've already received. The world is buying for your time and your attention. The world wants your soul. Are you going to give it to them? Or are you going to fight back? Or are you going to take a stand? Listen, your future depends upon it. Where God is leading you depends upon it. The open door that God has for you depends upon it. The next chapter, where God wants to open a door in your life depends upon it. You see, God has a plan for your life. I say it regularly here from this pulpit, but, but it's true. There's something that God has before you. You want to get there? Or do you want to give up now? Do you want to make it to your promised land? Or do you want to say, it's too hard? You know, there's not a time that I didn't run the course that time I was done on those three miles. Smelling like donuts and all. That afterwards, I, I was glad that I hung in there. Oh, going up that hill in Batavia or St. Charles, going around. Sometimes a little rain and mud all over you. I'm thinking, oh, this, is, this is terrible. Who cares about wrestling? Things begin to play. Who cares? But then I saw someone and then I put myself and I said, no, I got to keep going. Because I knew that there was... If I stand next to a moosey, I had my brain in January. I knew that I had to be ready. I knew that in sectionals or district sectionals, I knew that if I made state, that I knew that I would need that moment then. That I need to push myself. You know what I'm talking about. What about you and your life? The devil is trying to buy your soul. The devil is trying to ruin your life. The devil says, the Bible says, it this, Jesus says it this way. The enemy is out to kill, steal, and destroy. If that is not the way it is in our world today, come on. The enemy wants to wipe out the church. The enemy doesn't like the church. Has the enemy ever liked Jesus? Who's the church? It's Jesus. So the enemy has always been at war against Jesus. He knows his time is short. He knows that he's lost the battle. 
and you've won. But he wants to deceive you. He wants to wear you down. He wants to get you to think that it's a lost cause. It's not worth it. There's another way. As one of my daughters once said, not in that way. She didn't mean it. But I know what she meant. Now she would apologize to me after having a few kids of her own, which I think I need. No. I want to talk about what's it mean to stay the course. What's it mean? What does the race you're in look like for you? Number one, three things Paul says here. Paul calls it good. I'm looking at it completely different than I did in the past. He calls it truth. And he calls it a calling. That's right. Paul, when he's talking about the race he's in, when he's talking about uh, uh, staying the course, he says, you're running a good race. So I'm talking about our life. I'm talking about the life you're living or trying to live. He calls it good. He calls it, who tried to keep you from obeying? He calls it truth. Another place, this kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. He calls it a calling. So I wanted to stay true to the way Joel is. I wanted to be positive about it, not look at the, the negative. I looked at, pointed out where Paul was coming from. And he, first of all, he calls it a good race. Let me tell you something. The life that God has called you to is good. It's the right life. It's the good life. You would be easy to look at it on a Monday, on a Tuesday, and I don't know. Maybe praying is not worth it. Maybe living right. Maybe I could just cash in my chips. Maybe I've done enough. I want you to be reminded that you were running a good race, a good life. God's called you at 16. God's called you at 8. God's called you at 50. You've been at this thing a while. But the enemy throws it all at you. No, I don't know. And tries to wear you down. You've been up all night. You've been working. You're working. You've lined up on your line on a Monday, on a Tuesday. Is it worth it? I think I'll just do my thing. Doing your thing can cost you your life. Come on. What, what's the race look like for you? What's the race you're in? You're in a race. Do not tell me you're not in a race. You're in a race whether you want to believe it or not. Once you've been born, you're in a race. You're in a fight. You're living your life. It's called fighting the good fight of faith. You know all about that. But it's being challenged today where you're at. Jesus said it was going to be challenged. He said deception is going to blanket the earth. Only a few. There will be a mass exodus, he said. Come on. Read Matthew 24. I used to preach on it regular back in my olden days. It's about time I dusted off a little bit. But I want you to be reminded about why you bought into this thing. I needed to tell my daughter a few times, oh, maybe it's okay to make some shifting here. I understand the meaning of what she meant. But she was exploring and this and that. I get it. But from time to time, we need to be reminded of what we signed up for. Of what we got ourselves into. Is it the right thing? Paul called it good. You know, good wasn't used in the spiritual sense of the scripture a lot. The Father did, God did. After he made creation, he said, this is a good thing. Sometimes I remember that, that I want to use the word great. I know maybe I hear it too much in another context. But I settle for good. 
I want God's word where he says, and Paul used the same, says, you are running a good race. Let me tell you something. You have a good life. You got to know it. You got a good life. You ought to be thankful for what God has done for you. He's brought you a long way. He's stuck with you thin and th thick and thin. He's forgiven your sins. He's helped you. You need to not buy into the enemy's lie about your life. We need to know that he that began a good work in us is going to finish it. That God has been there contending with you all along. I remember on the highway at 16, in the middle of Wyoming, Montana, I don't know where I was, was a few times, and sitting there, looking up to the scars on my, on my backpack, the ones we had then, and sitting there, finding a place for the night on the road on 80, hitchhike along the way. And I know for a fact that that pilgrimage the Lord put me on. I know for a fact when I came down and I was going through that program, I know for a fact that that was a start of God doing something good in my life. My friend, my sister, my brother, you don't dare abandon what God has started in your life. It's a good thing. Only a few may go there. Only a few may survive it. But you're going to be one of those. Let me tell you something. So forgive me for being a little harsh. My wife will tell me afterwards, John, you got to be gentle. Okay, I will after the message. But it, you, you're on your last day on this earth. Picture it. You're about ready to draw your last breath. I've been, I, I'm around that every week. Someone in our church, I, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, but I'm with them. And the nurses would say, still on a ventilator. So I see the, the his, his, his head was open. I see, I know what it is. I, I'm around, I, I, I'm a, that's what I do at times. But picture you. Because one day we're all going to die. Unless God catches us. When I talk about, when I say die, no, we're never going to die. Our spirits, I'm talking about our bodies now. Because unless we're caught up to the sky, unless Jesus comes first. But picture the natural death. You've seen it. Did you know when you're laying there, you're going to think back, like Sue and I, like I shared with you, and you're going to go through your life. But the greatest thing that you're going to have is when you say, when you said, yes, I'm glad I serve the Lord. The thing that you're going to hold on to is not how much money you have, where you've been, how many relationships. No, the thing that you're going to hold on to, that you're going to know was the right thing when you made a decision to go to church, when you made a decision to treat someone right. When you made a decision to give someone something that they didn't have, that's going to be the thing that matters. When you made a decision to help someone in need, when you made a decision to pray that prayer, when you wanted to just do your thing, oh, you're going to have regrets. We all have regrets. But God's faithfulness is going to overshadow you because you're a child of God. You fought the good fight of faith. You finished the course. And you're going to look and say, this was a good life. God's been good to me. I want to talk you into, yes, am I? That's what preaching's about. That's what the Word of God is about. That's why he wrote the Word. He says, write it down. He knew that we'll go astray. Before in verse 1, it says, who, who cut in on you? Well, he says it here. Who, how did you get, you were once here. How'd you get there? So I'm, I'm, I'm here, yes, to talk you into lining up on that line again. I admit it. But does the news admit it? What they're trying to do to your life? 
Does the world admit what their real, their real agenda? And they probably don't even know their agenda because they take their orders from places in dark places and they, maybe some don't even know it. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to talk about the word and what God says about your life. He says, you are running a good race. Let me tell you what you embarked on. And I'll move on to my second. I'm sorry, because I want to be done. And I want to be done early since. And we get some more people back if we're done a little bit earlier. No. I want to say what you started on. It's, it's, it's a good thing. It's the good life. And maybe the hard life. As you're running around that corner, as you're running it up on a Thursday. No, I'm going to stick to it because I see down the road that God's going to introduce me to something. God's going to do something. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to stay clean. I'm going to stay pure because I believe that God has something better for me. And my future is too important. So I'm going to stay on the path. You know what? Sometimes I want to do this degenerate guy you're looking at. I see another path and I go, oh, I could cut down there. I could cut off a quarter mile. And I could get with all those good people there in first place. Because I could run through the tree. I only thought that once. Don't judge me now. Because you're running and you see, oh, the path picks up over there. I'm just going to cut through the trees. None of us want to be disqualified in life, do we? So we stay on the path. But the first thing, once again, you've got to know that it's the good life that God has chosen you. It's the, it's, the, it's the right thing. The second, no, that's, I'm saving that. Who cut on and kept you from obeying the truth? He calls it truth. The race you're in, it's truth. What do you mean? I don't know. Even this preacher at time begins to wonder, once a year, I may have this cross. My, am I doing the right thing as far as truth? Is there really another way? I heard it on TV. Someone said you could go to God this way or that way or this. There's lots of ways to God. Okay, maybe one time it gets through, even there. But I want to remind you that you are serving truth this morning. In spite of what the world challenges you with. There's either truth or there isn't. You've chosen truth. Either the gospel is truth or it isn't. Jesus is truth. My brother, my sister. I don't care what the world is pitching today. We're not buying into it. Torn set it up well in his speech about the word. Is it relevant today or not? Is it something applicable or maybe the new thing of the day? Oh, societies are going to come and go. Kings are going to come and go. Tyrants are going to come and go. Political parties will come and go. But the word of God will last forever. And I'm here today to tell you that the course you're embarking on is right. Not too many people find the right thing. You found it. When you find the right stock, whoa. I don't know if there is the right noise. Right stock. But you found the right thing. You, you discovered truth. Who's that person we were talking about earlier? Forrest Gump. Okay, a quick Forrest Gump illustration. He's running along, and he's running along, and they're all following him behind. His beard is tired. You could tell his legs were a little stronger. And he, I'm tired. I'm tired. On the stretch of the highway, turns around. I'm going home. I'm going home. What? What? We followed you. Your truth. We followed you all this way across the United States. As they were running across the United States, corner to corner. I'm going home. It would be easy for the enemy and let me bridge that a little bit because it may not be completely applicable. But you're tired. It would be easy for you to begin to question. That's what deception is all about. Questioning. But oh, no, 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 no. That's why I'm just glad they, 
sing the old hymns. Sometimes we do need to sing the old hymns to understand how much this thing has survived. That's why I changed the flags on the front. I had different flags, but I changed them. I put all the American ones. Why? Because I wanted to stick my finger in something I know. Because I know we're going through something now that maybe even the survival of the next generation could almost be at stake in a, in a way that we know it. And I want to fight. I want, I want Jesus to be the rulers of our lives and not some, some organization, some man, but what, that, that God will have his way in our life. We're living in a time where they're vying for, where the spirit of the, the scriptures call it an antichrist spirit. And that's at work. Obeying the truth. I just want you, and I'm going to go on, what you have embarked on is the truth. That's my point to you and my second point. It's the right thing. It is the only thing. Let me tell you something. Jesus and you is enough. I know that's simplistic and people make fun of it, but I'm here to tell you, Jesus and you in your life is enough. It's the truth. You've received the truth. You're far ahead than those that learn the compounding. And I don't, I'm not making any judgments or disparage remarks. I'm trying to tell you what you've received is precious. It's big. You're richer more than you know it. You can't measure what we're talking about this morning in dollars, in cents, in gold or rubies. We're talking about eternal valuation. We're talking about you living forever. We're talking about something that is greater than this earth and the cheapness of it. Sometimes I... I'm sorry for saying this about news. I turn on the news and then I have, I only have three channels. I listen to four, flip through four. I don't know why they give me 300, 200. I don't know. Cause it's the package, right? I get the cheapest package. So. But then I turn on that and I think this is cheap. I don't care if it's my favorite channel or not. It's cheap. It's, it's getting me dirty. Because then I flipped to my other one, 735, worship. And I could listen to that all day long. And my, my kids, that's why they get mad at me. Sometimes I do. And I just keep it on and study or whatever. Or even in the background. Just in the background. And you know what? Heaven on earth is much better than the cheapness that the world is trying to sell you and I today. They're telling you it's the right way. 